Hello friends. Today we are going to discuss about serial killers. Part 3. We will be focusing on why a person becomes serial killer. That is the etiology of the serial killer. I am Dr. Suresh Badadmat, Professor of Psychiatry, working at National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore. In this video, I will be discussing about the serial killer. What are the reasons why a person becomes a serial killer? The question here is, are they born or they are made during their life? And also, are serial killers mad or bad? Should they get insanity defense for their heinous crime? Are they normal or they have mental illness? Will be discussed in this video. As per FBI, a serial killer is an individual who has committed a series of two or more murders in a separate incidents, typically involving some degree of psychological and emotional gratification. These murders are often committed over a period of time and there is a cooling off period between the two episodes of crime. As per the FBI definition, Invariably, it focuses on it should be repetitive in nature, premeditated or semi premeditated. The motive behind the serial killing either it can be emotional, sexual, anger, financial, or to have a dominance over another human being. And invariably, it involves a ritualistic behavior. We call it as a signature behavior of the serial killer and in between the episodes of killing they will return to their normal life. The hallmark is becoming normal that is cooling off period between the episodes of crime. If you look at the motive of the serial killers it is entirely different from a normal homicide crime scene. For most part serial murders involve the victim as a stranger. There will be no relationship between the victim and the serial killer. And the motive is very difficult to find in serial killing. Invariably, in a homicidal crime, if you are able to find the motive, it is easy to find the perpetrator. Whereas in serial killers, since there is no relationship between the serial killer and the victim, and it is difficult to find the motive. Invariably, this is an important point which distinguishes between the serial killers and a normal human who kills the people. Serial, mur serial murderers' crime scene can have a bizarre futures that may cloud the identification of the motive. The behavior of a serial murderer at a crime scene may evolve over a period of series of crime and manifest with the different interaction over a period of time. This interaction between the offender and the victim will give you the signature ritualistic behavior of the serial offender. Many a time, regardless of the motive, the serial murderers want to commit this crime. Invariably, the pain inflicting pain on another human being and having a dominance over another person, the crime itself is a pleasure and the motive. Invariably, the serial offenders or the killers select the victim based on availability, vulnerability and desirability. The motive can be any of them from anger, power, thrill to kill, sexual, ideology, financial gain, criminal underworld and the combination of above. One need to understand, these serial killers usually evolve over a period of time. Invariably, they may look normal in their childhood. If you look deep into their behavior, invariably you can see they are odd and isolated in their childhood. They may not have many friends. 
few of them have a triad of bedwetting, fire setting and cruelty of animals. It is called as McDonald triad. And many of them come from broken family. And serial killers invariably have been subjected to various types of abuse. It can be sexual abuse, physical abuse or emotional abuse. And during adolescence, they develop deviant sexual fantasies. And invariably, they indulge in their fantasy at their virtual level. They do not initially act upon. Many a time, they try out to act upon on these fantasies. And many of them will have a characteristic of psychopathic personality. Psychopathic personality are those who do not have empathy, no regret, no remorse. And they plan the act of committing crime. Many a time they also have sadism, paraphilia, where they inflict pain on the other human being to get enjoyment, pleasure and even ejaculation. Many a time, few of these serial killers do have juvenile crime. Invariably, they would have been arrested for their offences. And many a time, this tryout crime would have ended up in, in the jail. Let's look into the etiology of the serial killers. Why do they do this? Are they normal? Are they mentally ill? Are they deliberately do it? First and the foremost, we will look into the various models which have been given by various researchers. The first model is diathesis stress model. This model was given by Stephen and Gian Angelo in 1996. Stress and diathesis model says that serial killers have an infirmity or a trait that is habitual and built in, which makes them to behave in a manner paramount to killing. If such traits comes in contact with any form of environmental aggravation, then it creates a dysfunctional problem. As you see this diagram, it clearly says it is a biological in nature. Their personality or their genetic makeup has a biological predisposition. They will have low arousal because of prefrontal cortex damage during the birth or a genetic pruning of the nerves and invariably the environmental stress provokes this genetic expression. Along with this, they have a predisposition with regard to self-esteem and self-control problem. That means they have a poor control on their behavior. In the background of biological predisposition, poor self-esteem, difficult to control their impulses and maladaptive coping behavior that is retreating into their sexual fantasies. This causes a decessity process and they commit this crime. It may be the first kill. And they, every time go through a stress, they enter into this coping mechanism of killing other people. The another theory is theory of palantization. It was developed by Loni Athens in 1992. This theory explains violent behavior such as murder, rape and assault occurs in the background of upbringing in a violent environment. This violent theory was created to help to explain how someone can be groomed to commit genocide or serial murders. It was later used by criminologists to explain the serial murders and more recently with regard to genocide. Here, the people who have been brainwashed from the childhood, certain people are harmful to their religion, to their survival, to their geography. They start committing crime on the other people. It may be called as terrorism, but however, they become insensitive to the other people's need and their emotion. Such as in war, the soldiers are brainwashed to kill the opposite people who are in the other country. The basic humanity is lost. That is the theory of this violentization. Theory of self-control. Travis 
and Michael in 1984 attempted to explain why crime is committed, especially such as violent offense and serial killing. In theory of self-control, this theory suggests that crimes are committed due to the lack of self-control due to poor parenting during the childhood. Invariably, the self-control it can be easily compared to bladder control which occurs in the childhood over a period of 6 to 10 years. And even they said that this self-control occurs at the age of 10 to 12 years and by that is by the age of 5th grade. If they do not learn because of various reasons, they lose control over their fantasies and they act upon it. And the next one is Fractured Social Identity Syndrome. Stephen Holmes, Ronald Holmes and Richard Twiskbergi gave this Fractured Social Identity Syndrome. To understand this Fractured Social Identity Syndrome, one need to understand the foundation of other two theories. That is, Charles Looking Glass Self and Goffman's theory, Virtual Social Identity and Actual Social Identity. Now let's look into the Looking Glass Self by Charles Coley which offered the explanation to the personality theory in 1902. Here the individuals consciously make effort to understand their own personality. He explained the individuals seek out information from those who are meaningful in their world or in their environment and makes determination on whether these people are worthy of making the judgment. That is, our own personality is unconscious and this comes into the consciousness by seeking validation from the known people and this theory was developed during Freud theory that is during 1902. So this was a significant development with regard to personality and this personality looking glass self was the theory. Along with this we need to understand this Goffman's theory of virtual social identity and actual social identity. An individual may change behavior when something of significant enters in their life during a vulnerable period. In this, let's understand about virtual social identity. It is a self-managed and presented to the public view. That means, I may have a personality inside what I project outside as a good person, very nice, loving person, that is the virtual social identity. The one which is inside, the personality who may be very selfish, that can be considered as actual social identity. It is not managed and it is the most accurate of self and only one close to the family members know about this actual social identity. Virtual is the one which is shown to the world. Actual social entity is the one who is self. And invariably, family members will get the glimpses of what is the true person he is. With regard to fractured social identity syndrome, in this both the theories, now we will understand this fractured social identity syndrome, which was given by Holmes and Richard Twiskbergi. It suggests a social event or a series of events during one's childhood results in fracturing of the personality of the serial killer. The term fracture is defined as a minor brokerage of the personality which is often not visible to the outside world and is only felt by the killer. That means the person has dent into their personality or breakage of their personality because of various environmental abuses which they gain through. And this over a period of time accumulates and triggers the series and a cascaders of event. Serial killer's childhood will be similar to any other normal kid. Only the serial killer experiences the inner fracture and abuses which occurs at the environmental and family environment level. The virtual identity masks from identifying the actual identity of the serial killer. For people 
the serial killer looks normal but only during the serial killing episode he will reveal his actual identity to the victim and it will be temporary and that again will be marked by virtual identity that is about the fractured social identity now let's understand about social process theory social process theory states that offender may turn to crime due to a peer pressure family and friends it is a process of interaction with the social institution which everyone has the potential for a criminal behavior social learning theory can be used when used and understood when a soldier gets praised and accommodated for killing the other country's soldiers they will be given various medals galler appraised and even hike in their salary this social process theory makes the human being insensitivity to the other human beings in both military and also serial killing the offender or the soldier may becomes desensitized to the killing and starts compartmentalizing those feelings as it's my duty to do it the soldiers do not see enemy personal as a human being they also have family they have children he has father and mother that will not be taken into account they will compartmentalize it as he is a soldier he may kill me or i will kill him this social theory disregards the biological substrates put forward it that people are not criminals all the time but the combination may pl- play a role but however organic theory do has some explanation there are many people in the past have been recognized and studied there are few individuals who sustain severe head injury especially to the frontal that to medial frontal lobe lobe can cause severe violence and aggression further many patients with epilepsy who having uncontrolled seizures usually develop irritability arterial sexual behavior and many a time violent towards the people there were a couple of serial killers who had brain tumors and they invariably used to lose temper and used to become violent there is a hypothesis which has also mentioned the serial killers and violent sexual offenders do have minimal brain damage which occurs during the childbirth or maybe during the childhood when they sustain repeated head injuries further neurodevelopmental theories such as autism spectrum disorders often they do not have any emotions towards the other they do not get connected with normal human beings they indulge in their stereotypical repetitive behavior many a time they may develop paraphilias and they may act upon it hence the autism has been found in few people who are serial killers further neurodegenerative disorders like frontotemporal dementia are well known to cause impulsive behavior sexual disinhibition at the same time sexual action against the family members and also with the family members which have been completely societally has been not allowed like incest can happen hence frontotemporal dementia can also be considered as one of the hypothesis for serial killers where their brain is damaged as i mentioned earlier macdonald strad it was first identified by a forensic psychiatrist john marshall macdonald in 1963 in his paper he published which was published in american journal of psychiatry titled as the threat to kill this macdonald triad has linked to animals cruelty obsession with fire setting and persistent bedwetting these people are known to become violent and particularly homicidal behavior and also sexual predatory behavior is well known as per his theory and presentation this is how the triad looks that is 
up to the age of 10, 12 years or more, they continue to have bedwetting, cruelty towards animal, killing them and fire setting. If these three are clearly seen, there is a high possibility in future he may indulge in violent sexual behavior. Further, there were neurochemical and genetic theories. Solomon in 2006 stated that Men with low levels of monoamino oxidase A enzyme involved is breaking down of catecholamines. If this enzyme is less, they are more likely to be sentenced for violent behavior before they reach 26 years. This was a study. And also, low levels of serotogenic activity indicates impulsivity and self destructive violent behavior. Here you can see in this diagram. The patient who has low levels of monoamino oxidase A enzyme, this occurs by genetic expression where these enzymes are produced less. And this results occurs because of the genetic expression because of harsh environment. This leads to hyperactive amygdala, underactivity of prefrontal cortex. This leads to negative emotional silence, salience and decreased emotional control over their impulses. And this causes increased likelihood of acting upon their impulses and fantasies. There has been a huge research publication with regard to serial killers and childhood abuse. Research has suggested that the profile of a serial murderers you can see there is a chain of events which is linked to childhood abuse. It is possible that because of this childhood abuse, habituation, tolerance of pain, depending on the extent to which the abuse has experienced, the serial killer will inflict on others. Childhood abuse has also been associated with later poor cognitive processing or cognitive processing problem which may lead to aggressive thought pattern. Further, cognitive processes which are faulty such as encoding errors, hostile attributional biases, accessing of aggressive responses and positive evaluation of aggressions. Research has shown that there is a very strong link between early childhood abuse and individuals who kill for sexual gratification that is lust, rape, Typology. 50% of the serial killer reported that they have experienced psychological abuse, 36% physical abuse, and 26% sexual abuse. Invariably, the abuse does not occur alone. That means physical abuse will be accompanied by psychological and sexual abuse, or sexual abuse can be accompanied by others, which is the predominant is the one we need to look into it. In this regard, a landmark study was done with regard to sexual abuse, sexual killers and abuse. The title of the study was A Behavioral Sequence Analysis of Serial Killers' Lives from Childhood Abuse to Methods of Mur Murder. This study was done by Marono and his colleagues in 2020. This article is published in Psychiatry, Psychology and Law. This is one of the biggest serial killers analysis. The number of serial killers analyzed were 233 and this included from 1850 to 2014. The methodology was gaining access to all the documents which documented regarding the serial killer's life. It can be FIR, it can be books written on them, it can be autobiography written by themselves, videograph, photographs and various literature was collected and they were used for the analysis. In this, they have come up with a behavioral sequence analysis. Let's understand this method. What is this BSA? It referred to a lag sequence analysis is a method for investigating how a chain of behavior 
and the events are linked over a time. It is a valuable method for understanding the dynamic relationship between progression of behaviors and social interactions occurring over a time is a behavior sequence analysis. How one behavior is related to the another behavior. And each behavior can be provoked by an event in the environment. And this involves a sequence that can be understood by the transition between behavioral pairs. It can be lifetime, which is called as large sequence, or a small sequence which occurs in milliseconds. Another one is a lag one. Here, the time period, maybe hours to days, can be considered as a lag one. Lag one behavioral sequence analysis. Here, the antecedent behavior, it is the type of abuse, antecedent is a abuse, is the first event in pairing and the sequitur. The sequitur is the behavior or the murder behavior. That murder behavior is the second behavior. Antecedent, invariably the abuse. Invariably you can consider it as a stress over a period of time. And the sequitur is the consequences which happens invariably. It is killing of other human being or it can be animals initially. Obviously, there are intervening behaviors and events through the antecedents and the sequitur, but it allows to understand the serial killer's life, time, how they behave. The analysis indicates which pairing of behaviors occurs above expected level of chance or instances. If an individual suffers abuse type A, how likely abuse B and C occurs is studied under this behavioral sequence analysis. In this study, they defined what is physical abuse, sexual abuse and psychological abuse. Physical child abuse was relates to the act that causes actual physical harm or have the potential to cause physical harm. Sexual abuse is defined as those acts in which child is used for sexual gratification. Psychological abuse includes the lack of appropriate and supportive environment or acts that have an adverse effect on the emotional health and development of the child. With this definition, they started analyzing all the serial killers. As I mentioned, 233 serial killers were analyzed, which occurred between 1850 to 2014. If you look at the table, the psychological abuse was seen in 15%, physical abuse 15%, sexual abuse 9%. But however, if you look at the combination, Psychological and physical is 38. Physical and psychological and sexual is 20%. However, invariably the sexual abuse gains importance because the victim may become the perpetrator over a period of time. If you look at that, the sexual abuse alone is only 9%. Physical and sexual abuse is only 3%. Invariably, the physical, psychological and sexual abuse is the 20%. Many a time it is very difficult to delineate between these abuses. A person who abuses the child sexually, invariably he will threaten the child, physically abuse the child and then only he will abuse sexually. So the combination usually plays a role. And emotional abuse appears to have a maximum impact becoming callous and also loss of regret regarding other humans emotions. Let's understand physical abuse. When they analyzed physical abuse, you can see the physical abuse invariably leads to rape, that is the lust. And since they have been physically abused earlier, they commit the crime in a quick lightning manner. That means the kill is occurred very fast. They bound the victim and they kill very fast. They do not involve in much torture. They rape and they kill immediately. That is physical abuse. So that is physical abuse in childhood. Lead to rape and bound and quick kill. And they leave the body at the crime scene. If you look at the psychological abuse. If there is a psychological abuse. It leads to rape. Torture. Evidence of overkill and mutilating the body of the victim and disposing of the body. 
the psychological abuse takes time physical abuse can be inflicted very easily psychological abuse requires time that means they would like to see the person undergoing psychological torture hence invariably they rape they torture again they rape they continue to torture to see how the person gets frightened they degrade that person they humiliate that person they cut the bodies of the person so that the perpetrator also gets gratification by abusing another human being this psychological manifestation creates a huge amount of time hence they need to plan it they take the person to a secluded place and invariably they cut the body pieces into small more small so that they dispose and throw in undisclosed places so in this psychological abuse the rape and financial gain is common torture is seen cutting the body into pieces scatter the body pieces and enjoy the abuse they have done sexual abuse it's very complicated the sexual abuse you can see there is a rape torture tie the victim exercise power invariably financial gain is looked after it mutilate the body parts blindfold evidence of overkill and also invariably they engage in necrophilia that is having sex with the dead bodies so this is again you can see there is a sexual gratification more will be power anger financial gain overkill is seen torture blindfold mutilation of the victim having sex with the dead bodies and dispose the body invariably the combination of abuse presents in any format invariably it will be rape lust financial gain mutilation overkill and really quick kill also is seen if the physical abuse is very high and move the body from the site of committing the crime if you look at the critic of this childhood abuse you can see many children in developing countries undergo physical abuse psychological abuse and sexual abuse but many of them do not become serial killers so this hypothesis is already questioned further the siblings that is brother and sisters of the serial killers do share the same environment same family same family conflict same type of abuse same socio economic environment and but they do not become serial killer and invariably they do also share 50 to 70% of the genetic material just because a person has undergone childhood abuse and parental conflict does not explain the serial killer behavior completely it is a part of the serial killing that means childhood abuse is a trigger the entire sequence as a weapon is a genetic material in this regard there are various neuroimaging studies have been done existing neuroimaging studies clearly identified three regions in a violent offenders and they are significantly different from the average normal people they are amygdala prefrontal cortex and ventral striatum these are the areas which have been found to be hypoactive in neuroimaging studies as early as in 1994 mills and rain did a systematic review of 20 brain imaging studies these studies were done in violent sexual offenders either using ct scan mri or pet scanning the authors of the study concluded that if there is a frontal lobe dysfunction especially hyperactivity they are associated with violent non sexual offenders such as murder if temporal lobe dysfunction is there which is connected to amygdala these dysfunctions will lead to sexual activity and invariably 
non-violent behavior such as incest and pedophilia. Many times, to fulfill their gratification, they may become violent, but the violence is secondary here. If there is a dysfunction of both frontal and the amygdala or the temporal lobe function, then they are associated with combined both sexual and violent elements are known. So hence, the hypothesis which they put forward is in serial killers, invariably, there is a dysfunction of prefrontal cortex and temporal lobe amygdala complexes. There are various other neuroimaging studies also showed recently they have found reduced amygdala activation in psychopaths. They are unable to process the emotions of the others whenever it is a charged situation. They do not understand what is happening in the other person's mind or the emotions. They also found reduced ventromedial prefrontal cortex activation which is clearly linked with empathic response and moral decision making. They are unable to process this. Reduced insula activation, suggesting difficulties in processing and experiencing empathy for others suffering. Insula is the place where mirror neurons and empathy that is the suffering from others is not felt. As I mentioned, mirror neurons Disruption, a network involved in understanding and mirroring of the emotions of the others. Those mirror neurons play a crucial role. And if there is any kind of disruption, this leads to poor empathic response from that individual. They are psychopaths. That means they do not understand the emotions. They are unable to feel the pain of the other people. They do not even experience the pain with regard to other suffering. Anterior cingulate cortex monitors and processes the emotional conflict of self and others. If there is again a disruption along with the mirror neuron, invariably the psychopath becomes highly dangerous. Neuroimaging studies showed that there is a disruption of ACC and MNS during the task related to empathy that causes decreased activation in insula, amygdala and prefrontal cortex and they are the people who are psychopaths may get involved in dangerous violent offenses. Further, these are the people who have different cognitive style and distortions. Let's look into the neuropsychological processes. Palmero and Kosis described serial killers having a particular cognitive maps. They view the world as a hostile and are correspondingly unable to or unwilling to deal with the environment around them. They feel the environment has become very hostile to them and they have been treated very badly. Their commission of crime represents an act of narcissistic grandiosity, reinforcing their sense of entitlement to use other people's body and life for their gratification. Since they view the world as hostile, they also become hostile with the environment. Especially, they would like to see the sense of power over the victims. In a secluded place, they take them and they show they are superior, they are powerful, they can indulge in whatever they want. Beach and Michelle in 2005 carried out a systematic study of the cognitive styles and implicit theories of two groups of offenders. One is a rapist, another is a sexual murderer. Invariably, the sexual murderers spoke about some of the important cognitive style of thinking. They said women deserves and they all deserve to be punished, raped and killed. They had a cognitive style of power and dominance which is classically seen in the society where the male believes they can do anything to a woman. Further, another type of cognitive style of thinking was men cannot control their impulse. Men are guys like that. They want what they want. They will do what they do. That is, 
men cannot control their impulse and they should not be punished and they cannot own the responsibility of their behavior and the third one is women is seen as a sexual objects they are here in this world for satisfying males ego and males gratification the last one which is very dangerous is i take that what i want that is male entitlement i would like to do what i like to do so these kinds of cognitive style and distortions are very commonly seen in sexual murderers and rapists however none of this theory alone cannot explain serial killers and violent sexual offenders invariably the multifactorial etiology explains that serial murderers like all human beings are the product of heredity upbringing in the family and the choices what they make through the developmental period causality can be defined as a complex process based upon biological social and environmental factors a human cannot be expressed alone without an environment that means a genetic material requires an environment to express the combination of the genetics and the environment and the triggers involved will play a crucial role in addition to this factor these individuals can choose to engage in a violent behavior not to engage in a violent behavior the choices they make also play a role there is no single identifiable cause or a factors that leads to developmental of serial killers it is a combination of multiple factors which play a role the most significant factors that is the serial killers personal decision in choosing to pursue their crimes and gratification play a crucial role the development of social coping mechanisms begins early in life and progresses as a children to adolescents over a period of time they learn to interact negotiate and compromise with their peers substance abuse and also childhood maltreatment and the environment can lead to typical aggressive behavior as i mentioned the combination of factors play a role many a time various researchers have said psychopathy is inborn with a strong genetic component in it you cannot teach a psychopathy to become empathetic it is genetically ingrained at the same time it appears that environmental factors such as adverse environmental childhood experience also play a significant role in expressing these genetic materials however others authors have rejected the notion the lack of parental care parental rejection child neglect and other kinds of childhood trauma does not directly lead to serial killer it is the combination of genetic childhood abuse and environmental factors play a role now the question is whether the psychopaths are just bad or they are really mad mad means are they mentally ill sorry to use this word mad or bad that is the question when you see a serial killers committing crime invariably majority of the serial killers plan they choose their victim they take their victim to a secluded place isolated place inflict pain and torture multiple times they cut the body into pieces they fulfill their gratification by doing various inhuman activities they will destroy the evidence dispose the body and they know what they are doing it they know the consequences of the act and they know that it is against the law hence they aid from the public at large and they do multiple crimes invariably between the two episodes of crime they are completely normal that doesn't mean committing a crime is abnormal they are normal people they are not mentally ill very rarely serial mental serial killers have mental illness it's very rare most of the serial killers are normal they do not have mental illness just because somebody has diagnosed to have mental illness does not mean they will get insanity defense if a person who has mental illness and commits a crime they need to prove their mental illness was so severe 
they did not understand the nature of the act what they are doing they did not know the consequences consequences of the act and it was contrary to the law that means their logical reasoning should be completely lost along with the mental illness hence i would rather consider serial killers are a bad people not person with mental illness that means invariably serial killers do not get insanity defense all their killing is premeditated planned done in a clear intention for their sexual gratification gratifying their paraphilias hence they need to be punished even if they have brain disease such as brain tumor because they know what they are doing they know it is contrary to the law they know what their consequences of the act many a time the serial killers have their toolkit to inflict torture hence they need to be punished to conclude my dear friends it is the combination of factors which lead to serial killers the maximum impact is from the genetic material which leads to brain dysfunction hypoactivity in certain areas such as amygdala temporal lobe prefrontal cortex play a crucial role personality disorder like psychopathy autism spectrum disorder adds to the serial killer behavior paraphilia such as sadism homosexuality voyeurism necrophilia cross cross dressing and fetishism also play a role along with this childhood abuse and access to weapon leads to serial killing to conclude the factors which are clearly cause a serial killing is vulnerability factors perpetrating factors perpetuating factors and protective factors vulnerability factors are genetic perpetrating factors are childhood abuse or stressors perpetrating factors are ongoing stressor substance abuse not get not getting caught becoming very intelligent in disposing of the bodies the protective factors are appropriate parental style no abuse and excellent police investigation protects them from committing crime to conclude it is not a single factor it is the multiple factors and invariably genetic material plays a crucial role in serial killers and they do not get insanity defense serial killers are not mentally ill they are normal people who kill people for their sexual gratification thank you very much for your valuable time stay safe